Hi, thank you for joining me for my talk today at Botany 2021. My name is Justin Lung, a graduate student at UC Santa Cruz, and my talk is called Coastal Prairie Plants Responses to Competition and Drought Varies by Species and Invader Identity. Before we begin, I want to do a brief land acknowledgement that the talk I'm giving today was recorded on the unceded territory of the Swaswa speaking Uwipi tribe, uh, the ancestors of the modern Amamutsin tribal band. I also want to thank a very many people for their contributions and for allowing me to use their lab equipment and many students for assisting me with greenhouse maintenance and data collection and my generous funding support from the Keeley Coastal Research Award in the Northern California Botanist. Biomass partitioning is a really important plant physiological mechanism that allows plants to divert resources and allocate biomass to structures that uptake the most limiting resources. So in drought or nutrient poor systems, plants may allocate more biomass towards root structures and increase root growth. Whereas in areas where there's high above ground competition or a need for light or space, plants may uh, adjust or allocate more biomass towards their leaves or shoots. In areas where plants need to have high reproductive output, they may allocate more resources to uh, reproductive structures. Abiotic Abiotic stress often promotes root partitioning and biomass partitioning, um, but biotic stressors are often a little bit more mixed. And this is because biotic stressors like competition or pest and disease can cause plants to become limited in other resources aside from direct space or light, which would in generally increase above ground growth. But because competition can also deplete resources within the local soil environment, Competition could also potentially increase root biomass partitioning. We know climate change is going to increase the amount of droughts in California by increasing rainfall variability, increasing the frequency of drought, and prolonging the periods of drought. Increased droughts will likely increase allocation of resources to root biomass structures. And this is because plants, native and non-native, will likely want to develop greater root structures to take up the limiting water resource. We also know that non-native annuals often respond more negatively to drought than native California species. And in other studies, this has been shown to sometimes increase the cover or survival of native species and potentially lead to competitive release. Non-native species competition can be a really big problem in California grasslands. And even though large native perennials can withstand competition, we're losing a lot of grassland habitat, which requires restoration. And because we are restoring habitat, we often use seedlings of perennials and seed native annual forbs. And those are often more sensitive to, to competition. And competition can often adversely affect their survival. And so understanding more about how drought and competition will interact to influence native community structure and survival will be really important in the face of climate change for restoration. California coastal prairies are a really rare type of habitat that exists within a very slim range of the coastal areas in California. California grasslands have already been reduced to 25% of the original extent and native grasslands have been reduced to less than 1%. California coastal prairies only makes up a very small portion of this 1% of existing native grasslands in California. However, they're really important because they have really high diversity, one of the highest diversities of herbaceous grasslands in, North Amer in temperate North America. And this is uh, mostly due to a large number of forbs, both annual and perennial, although the annual forbs can often be more sensitive and hard to restore. What sets coastal prairies aside uh, what makes coastal prairies unique is the fact that they have summertime fog that often contributes summertime water to plants, allowing them to persist or grow a little more in the summer, which, which encompasses up to 40 to 60% of summer days. Because one of my previous studies in the field showed that native species had greater cover in drought compared to ambient rainfall plots and non-native species had lower cover, I was really interested in exploring the potential competitive release dynamics with native and non-native species in terms of drought. To better understand this, I proposed some hypotheses, such as native perennial species are adapted to drought, which can be observed through non-significant differences in biomass and carbon assimilation. 
non-native species competition will decrease native biomass production and non-drought watering conditions. Native species will experience competitive release in drought and competition treatments evidenced by greater native productivity in drought and competition compared to non-drought competition treatments. Today, because this is a short talk, I'll only be going over most of the morphological most of the morphological measurements and traits, and I won't be talking much about the physiological measurements. To better test these questions, we set up an experiment using these 10 species, five native and five non-native. On the top is Bromus carinatus, Stipopulcra, Diplocus orantiacus, Lupinus nanus, and Sedalcia malviflora, all native. For the non-natives, we use Carduus pycnocephalus, Fistuca bromoides, Geranium dissectum, Metacago polymorphus, polymorpha, and Raphinus sativus, and all of those are classified as invasive in California. For the native species, we chose a variety of life forms and families and phylogenetic histories to help encompass a larger range of plant diversity. We started the native species in flats and then transplanted them into one gallon pots when they were large enough. Once they were in one gallon pots, we allowed the plants to grow for six weeks before we sowed the non-native species treatment. The non-native species treatment after sown was well watered and allowed to grow for two weeks before we implemented the episodic drought in any of the treatments. We then implemented an episodic drought, which entails not watering the plants at all when they're in drought until they reach a stomatal conductance threshold of 0 0.05. Once they reach that threshold, we rewatered the drought treatment and the well-watered plants until they reached field capacity, and we allowed them to be well watered for 10 days. After 10 days, we implemented the second period of the episodic drought. And that period, we allowed them to again grow until they reached the stomatal conductance threshold. At that point, they were then harvested for final biomass measurements. We also took biomass measurements prior to implementing any treatment to establish baselines. For data collection, we measured the leaf gas exchange weekly at midday. We also measured the gas potential one time at the end of the treatment during dark time hours. We measured the leaf water potential of all the plants at each key watering period, and we measured the leaf traits, at specific leaf area, leaf lobeness, and major vein length per unit area, both prior to treatments and at the end of the second drought period. As mentioned previously, we measured the biomass for native species at the end of the drought period, and we took uh, sacrificial replicates at the beginning prior to any treatments to establish a baseline measurement. For non-natives, we also measured their above ground biomass at the end of the treatments. For both natives and non-natives, we measured the leaf carbon nitrogen and the delta carbon 13. So we found that competition affects biomass production for both natives and non-native species. And first I'll talk about the natives. So here on the y-axis, we have the root to shoot ratio. The greater the root to shoot ratio, the greater the root development is compared to the shoot or above ground development. We have the five native species here. And then on the x-axis, we have our drought treatments. And then the gold bars represent plants experiencing invasive competition. And the blue bars represent plants that have no competition. How, uh, how to read a box plot is the box represents the 50th, uh, the 50 percent range uh, within the center where the dark line in the middle is the median and the lines extending out of the box are the quartile ranges on either sides and the points are outliers. So here we found that drought only affected the biomass of Diplocus orantiacus, where it decreased the biomass, sorry, decreased the root to shoot ratio for Diplocus orantiacus and increased the root to shoot ratio for Stipopulcra, a native bunch grass, whereas Diplocus orantiacus was a shrub. For Lupinus nanus, a legumous forb, and Sedalcia maliflora, a non legumous forb, a competition tended to increase root growth. For non-native species, we found that geranium dissectum and raffinus sativus was often negatively affected by drought, where they had lower above ground biomass in response to drought. We found that the other species, Cardus pycnocephalus, Fistuca bromoides, and Metacago polymorpha did not have a significant effect of drought, but almost all the species measured here had a significant effect of competition with which native species it was growing in. And that indicates that Certain native species may be 
better at defending or comp competing against some of these non-native species, and that some of these non-native species may be more sensitive, and especially to drought. We found that native leaf traits were mostly affected by competition and not drought, and this is specifically referring to morphological leaf traits. In terms of physiological traits, which I won't talk about much today, I just want to mention that those ones were primarily affected by drought and not competition. We find that Lupinus nanus, a uh, nitrogen-fixing forb, was the most sensitive to competition and drought, and this could be because they have greater trade-offs and requirements as being a nitrogen fixer. We found specific leaf area was the most responsive trait to competition and drought of the five species for the five species we measured and the three morphological traits we measured. We found that certain species lose more photosynthetic ability from drought and recover faster from drought during competition. On the y-axis here, we have the five different native species. And then on the x-axis for the each respective panel, we have percent loss of assimilation, which is the relative loss of photosynthetic ability when experiencing drought and then recovering from drought. And then we have comparisons when the species lose assimilation, both in competition and not in competition. Percent recovery of assimilation is how much photosynthesis recovers after the plant is rewatered from the initial drought period. And the recovery rate is how fast the photosynthetic ability recovers after being rewatered. And so we found that, as expected, some species had lower loss of assimilation when they weren't experiencing competition. However, Diplocus orantiacus, for some reason, had greater loss of assimilation when it was when it was growing on its own versus with competition. We also found that certain species recovered more quickly from, from, from loss of photosynthetic ability. For, for example, Bromus carinatus recovered more quickly with competition, whereas Diplocus orantiacus was negative, recovery rate was negatively affected by competition, whereas none of the other species had an effect. Overall, we found coastal prairie species have a unique response to both drought and competition, and that it's important to further understand and explore a diverse array of species response to understand how to better conserve native diversity in the future. We found morphological traits were primarily affected by competition and physiological traits primarily affected by drought for our study species. And this could be because physiological traits respond more instantaneously than morphological traits, which take time to develop. And drought happens immediately, affecting immediate plant development. Perennial species in our study could withstand drought, but the one annual form that we had in our study was sensitive to drought. Again, further highlighting the necessary need to study more annual forms and their responses to both drought and competition. So what does this mean for management and for future studies? Well, first off, we can think about selecting climate smart plants, which means we could try to select plants during dry years that are less affected by drought and can potentially recover more quickly from drought in terms of photosynthesis. And they may be able to withstand competition a little bit better from invasives as well. Some examples of these from our studies are Bromus carinatus, Stipopulca, and Stalcia malviflora. We can also think about introducing more sensitive species like Lupinus nanus and Diplocus orantiacus and potentially other annual forbs during wetter years when they are more likely to establish and reproduce and add seed to the seed bank for future years. We could also think about targeted removal of non-natives that aren't really affected by drought. So in our study, we found Raphinus sativus and Geranium dissectum were negatively affected by drought, and therefore it may be best to focus non-native species removal efforts on other species that aren't already being reduced and affected negatively by drought, such as Cardus pycnocephalus, Metacago polymorpha, and Fistuca bromoides. In terms of physiological literature, we now, this adds to our knowledge about what happens with biomass partitioning when plants experience competition in, in conjunction with drought. And so generally with drought, we would expect plants would have greater root partitioning, but previously and currently, um, how plants respond to biotic stressors like competition is a little more varied. But in our study, we found that plants often increase their root 
biomass partitioning in response to competition as well. And this could be because uh, non-natives are competing more heavily for underground resources with the natives compared to above ground resources, which is which might be what is pushing towards below ground growth. Thanks for coming to my talk. I would love to hear any questions or comments you have about my research. You can reach me on my email below at jluong4 at ucsc.edu. You can also follow me on Twitter for updates at Justin C. Lung, L-U-O-N-G. Or you can also follow me on my Instagram, Stipe Apokra. Thank you. Have a great day.